As a professional boat tester, I've come to love Finland over the last 10 to 15 years. I frequently come to the Finboat Floating Show and I love everything about the Finnish kind of boating culture. So when Jaco Kantala, the uh, designer of the new Defender 9, told me I should come up because he's going to take a boat right across the Baltic to Stockholm, I was immediately quite excited by that. Three days, four days, stopping at various islands en route, having a great time, and not just testing a boat for a couple of hours, three, four hours, but testing a boat over the period of four days. It was not something I was going to pass up. So, two hours after leaving Helsinki on our first leg, about 32 nautical miles later, and boat behaving beautifully, we're stopping at a restaurant that uh, Yako knows well, and not just for a sandwich and a cup of tea, but for a three-course meal, apparently. If that's uh, how this voyage is going to be, I'm pretty content with that, I have to say. OK, well, that's, uh, that's lunch done. We've had three courses. It was absolutely delicious. We had a, a Finnish vegetable soup with salmon roe, which was beautiful, followed by perch and then strawberries and a local ice cream. And now, apparently, we got a 35 nautical mile leg to a pretty little waterfront uh, village called Hanko to refuel and have another coffee. And then a uh, final leg, 40 miles for the day, to the CEO's house, that's Erki Tavella. Um, for some more food, I would assume, a couple of beers, and hopefully, this is not confirmed, but hopefully another sauna. So the fact of the matter is that, that the Finnish use their boats every day, and not just as playthings, but as kind of uh, commuting devices as well. They're part of everyday life. And that has a couple of really um, obvious impacts on the way you see people go boating here. In, in the first instance, it means that the boats they, they test and build and put on the water are ergonomically very sophisticated. You settle in at the helm of a boat like this, the throttle, the foot brace, the seating, the view, the wheel, everything falls exactly to hand because people who boat every day don't accept anything less than that. So we just had a, a lovely stop, our second lunch of the day actually, in uh, Hanko. It's a tremendously lively spot, even on a, uh, a Monday afternoon before the uh, finish of the working day. So it's a really enjoyable place to be. Actually, the, the harbour's really enjoyable too. We've got the usual kind of Finnish brands. We've got, you know, Sargos and uh, Targas and uh, Nordstars and so on. What I'm really enjoying is the mix of materials and boat shapes. There's all sizes, all shapes. There's aluminium hulls, little polyethylene hulls. It's a tremendously vibrant mix of boat styles you get in this place. So it's not all just about the, the big stuff, the big posh stuff. There's some far more modest boats around these parts. And that's lovely to see. Anyway, we've got to leave here now. It's about 15 nautical miles for the next leg, and that's to Eki Talvela's private island, his private house, where we're going to spend the night, have a bit more food and a bit more fun. And I can't wait for it. This is our final stop of the day. We're at Erki's private island. I have to say the boat has looked after us impeccably. I mean, the weather conditions have been very friendly, perhaps not so much tomorrow but I'm looking forward to a little bit of extra comfort tonight. And given the greeting committee we had, not just Erky, but his wife and his son-in-law and his grandkids all coming out onto the pontoon, I don't think I've ever felt so welcome in my life. So I think we're gonna have a blinding night. Now, one of the things I always really look forward to on a trip to Finland is a sauna. And it's a really deeply ingrained part of Finnish culture and a very important part of Finnish culture. The, the Finnish man is traditionally a very masculine, slightly reticent, uh, slightly insular sort of man, strong but reluctant to talk, certainly to talk in any depth. And the brilliant thing about a sauna is that you get naked, you sit there in a hot box with a bunch of blokes, everyone's equal, top CEO of a top company, a, you know, a man with no money, no job. Everyone sits there on an equal footing, they drink beer, they have a chat about the day, they warm up, they feel great, and it's essentially a form of therapy that enables Finnish men and visitors like me to open up in a way that perhaps they wouldn't without the benefit of this. So I am going to get straight in there and enjoy the best part about visiting Finland. So here we are, morning on Erkis Island. It's day two. Uh, our first leg is going to be a 45, 42, 45 nautical mile trip down to the southernmost 
uh, island in Finland where apparently there's a beautiful lighthouse that we need to see. Uh, but before we get going, which is in about half an hour before the winds pick up, which apparently are going to be sort of 20 knot westerlies, I just want to have a quick talk about the boat because it's looked after us so impeccably to this point. And there's a lot of good things to point out on it. And it, it's all about user friendliness. It's all about practicality. And right from the bow where we've got that step through bow, that in itself is a great feature. You've got the little um, opening hatch to feed your lines down to store them without removing them from the cleats. Again, user friendly. And you've got the, the, the hatch on the foredeck to access the baggage space, just to chuck your gear down below and get going. Um, and then there's the pilot house itself. Of course, on uh, the Explorer versions, we've got a full beam uh, pilot house. Here we've got something uh, narrower. So you've got four forward facing seats still, uh, all sheltered with great views through these huge one piece windows. But you've still got a walk around configuration that enables you to get from the aft end of the swim platforms all the way to that four peak without any disturbances anything to get in your way at all. And that's, that's a really valuable asset when you're carrying baggage and you need to get fore and aft, you need to take photographs and you're trying to see the view. In all regards to this point, I have to say the Defender 9, it's billed as a kind of explorer's boat, a kind of outward bound boat, uh, a boat that can take you places other boats can't go. So there's the kind of uh, leathery matte finish we have on the dash. On boat number one, I was also spotting the fact that there are no cup holders. Well, that's remedied. We got two up on the, the dash there and another two down below in the central part. And the Simrad remote, which was down there, kind of out of the way of the uh, pilot, has been relocated just next to the steering wheel, uh, exactly where you'd want it. Now, of course, <laughs> Yako, the designer, he's not content with one opinion or two opinions. He wants a third opinion. So he'd ideally like uh, space for an iPad to go here so that when his wife insists on driving, he can be involved. Um, but to be honest, as it is here, that's a lovely setup. And what's uh, equally impressive on this boat is the fact that these seats now have moved forward on little elevated moldings here. They're still adjustable so you can go fore and aft and get the perfect position, but it does mean that to get to the aft bench here, you've got a much wider space, and that's really impressive. Now, I actually slept on this boat last night because, you know, let's face it, it's a weekend and it's designed to do exactly that. It's designed to take you places and then enable you to sleep there. Uh, so I thought to test it properly, that's what we ought to do. Let's go and take a look at what we see down below. So as you can see, there's a good deep bed space and I stretched out fully here. Uh, so the space is about six foot four. You can really stretch out, that's not a problem. You've also got a, a nice little storage space in the front, plus storage in here and little shelving units here. And to port, you've got a proper dedicated separate heads compartment with a, a really good size of sink and with a shower fitting as well. And that's impressive on a boat of this size. But what I particularly love about this boat is the clever little touches that Yakko's managed to design in. So if we open the forward hatch, that gives you direct access to the foredeck. And if we then elevate that step, well, that's not just a step. Yeah, it can take you up onto the foredeck without banging your head and without any contortion act. But at the same time, because you've got good headroom here and good space. It's a great place just to sit two people and use this as a table with a glass of wine. There's a couple more things I want to point out that I particularly like from a, a design perspective. The first one is this curved bar um, to starboard of the throttles. Now when you're the co-pilot that's quite a useful place just to, to pop a hand. When you're the pilot, it's a great little armrest. When those throttles are pushed forward, it's a very natural place just to hold your, your arm steady and operate the throttles. But more importantly, because we have this cabin access right here, this bar prevents people from accidentally knocking the throttles on their way down and causing uh, accidents or difficulties for the pilot. So that's, that's a really thoughtful touch and it's not one I've seen on any other boat. So I'm very impressed with that. And further up, now clearly, the fact that we can reverse this seat, open up these canvases, tie them up and have an aft sunbed is, is a really useful thing. Particularly given this is quite a tough uh, outward bound boat, the fact that it's got that recreational versatility is brilliant because families will love that. 
But what I also like is the fact that it's designed specifically for the rough stuff, and you can tell that. I mean, for a start, we've got these impact mitigation seats. So they take the, uh, the, the sting out of those impacts. But what I really like is, is this here really big, strong stanchion uh, to hold the, uh, the roof. But when you're in the aft position, a lot of people, they don't want to sit. They don't want to sit and feel the impacts through their bottoms when the people in the front have the luxury of that impact mitigation. So as on a lot of open boats and ribs, you can stand here and you can hold on to that. And it's just a tremendously comfortable place to be. And more to the point, even though you're standing, because of this elevated roof, height and the extra head space, the extra headroom, you got a full view of the horizon all round. So we just made the uh, 45 nautical mile trip from Erki's house to Uta, which apparently in Swedish uh, means outermost island. It's perched right out here in the Baltic, the southernmost point uh, in Finland and it provides a great service for people, leisure boaters as well, to come in and, and get a bit of respite from the rougher waters out there. But I have to say, those rough waters have been quite a playground for us. Now, we were going along uh, in uh, tandem, the pair of us next to each other, uh, but of course, the Explorer 10 with its inboard 270, it behaves very differently to the new Defender 9. So the Explorer 10, it was quite comfortable cruising along at 20, 22 knots, nice and gentle, punching through those swells, punching through those steep, annoying little bits of chop with the white horses scattered amongst them. For us, we were a bit uncomfortable at that pace. So on the Defender 9, we were exploring, you know, using the trim tabs to keep the nose low and keep us flat and punch through. But to be honest, when we just got up to pace, got up to 35, 38, 40, 41 knots, and gave it even a little bit of a tr uh, trim into a head sea, just to get on top of those, uh, those swells and scoot across them. And right enough, we were burning, I guess, 120 litres per hour, which uh, is expensive, but that's not my problem, that's Yakko's wallet. I have to say, it was absolutely brilliant. It's so easy to use. I mean, they were quite aggressive seas, but even a novice could scoot across there at 40 knots, stay very comfortable, stay in control. And once you got your trim settings right and the pace right for that kind of wavelength, it was a real joy uh, to be involved with. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's the best part of the entire trip for me to this point, and that's saying something. But now we're at Uta, uh, which pretty much everyone here tells me is their favourite island in the whole of Finland. In fact, Jaco tried to book us a hotel here, uh, but it was fully booked, so that shows you how popular it is. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, getting amongst it and uh, seeing what this island has to offer. So it's the uh, end of uh, day two in terms of the boat stuff. Um, we've travelled the best part of 200 nautical miles, I think. Um, we had a great leg this morning, of course, to Uta, you know, really nailing it into those head seas, and the boat was fantastic with that. Um, from Uta to this place, Orland, it, um, it kind of changed a different direction. We had, we had big beam seas, and then we had big seas on the kind of port quarter, uh, kind of mixed up and messy, uh, which is it's quite difficult to drive to those conditions. Um, a little bit in, uncomfortable in parts, but... Uh, uh, Jaco assures me that this is Finland and that happened, so I'm, I'm, I've been happy to embrace it. But I do have to say, I've never been so delighted to see flat water as when we arrived at the harbour here in Orland. So I'm enjoying a bit of decadence, well-earned decadence, I might add, uh, and I can't wait to pop across the road to the hotel and have a well-deserved dinner. So day three, the uh, final leg that uh, will take us to Stockholm. The plan is to head west uh, across the Baltic and then to head southwest down the coast of Sweden to Stockholm itself. Trouble is, we've got some pretty robust southwesterlies blowing. Um, so Yako tells me that we'll be able to nip into the Swedish archipelagos in much the same way as we've done on the Finnish side um, and hide a little bit from the worst of those elements. In fact, he's actually promised me a river cruise all the way to, uh, to Stockholm. So I simply don't believe him about that, but I'm not concerned because, you know, we had some pretty robust conditions uh, for this boat to deal with yesterday. And despite, you know, a couple of screws coming loose, there's some things being tightened up now, I, uh, I have every faith that uh, the boat's going to look after us again today. So we stopped here at an island called Copper Clinta. I apologise for my pronunciation, I'm very English. 
because basically this is the last point before you're out into the open Baltic Sea. And this is obviously the most challenging part of our leg, particularly because we've got strong southwesterlies coming in from that direction. Now, Stockholm is basically that way, southwest. West across to the uh, Swedish coastline that way. We're apparently going to go slightly more north. We're going to go in that kind of direction. So we'll arrive at the Swedish coastline at a more northerly point. But the guys reckon their uh, archipelagos over there enable us to just nip behind and shelter from the elements a little bit before heading southwest. So instead of taking these big seas right on the, the bow, we're kind of expecting to ride them with the seas coming against us on the port beam, which ought to be a little bit more comfortable. It's time to uh, get going, get out into the open sea. And there's a palpable sense of excitement. It's not just from me, it's actually from Yako too. And, and that guy's been across the Atlantic twice. So really, this is uh, set up to be something quite special, I think. Well, that was a lot less painful than expected, in all honesty. I mean, for the, the, the first 10, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, we had to sort of cruise along at 15, 15 knots or so. Uh, and then we moved into the lee of the uh, Swedish coastline. It really settled down and was a bit like a lake towards the end, so we could accelerate right up to, to 30, 35 knots. So I, I don't know how long it took, but it certainly didn't seem to take very long. And it was actually a very, very pleasant trip. And we now stopped in Sweden at uh, Grislehamn Marina. Uh, and we're in an area I don't know the Swedish for it. Well, I did, but I've forgotten. It's called the High Coast Region. And apparently there's a passage, a protected kind of passage that goes uh, southwest from here that will take us uh, much closer to our destination in Stockholm. Well, we're here pretty much in Stockholm now. We've taken those relatively narrow passages all the way south. Plenty of shelter, beautiful scenery, and it feels kind of different from the Finnish side, actually. Uh, the Finnish side is kind of wild and rocky, and this feels a bit softer and greener. And we came through a beautiful uh, town, actually, called Vaxholm, which is well worth a visit. A beautiful castle and a really bustling seafront. But now we're here in Stockholm. I'm keen to find out what this city is all about. Well, after uh, three or four days, my time in Finland and Sweden is coming to an end. Uh, so before they put me on a plane and send me home, there's a couple of things I want to talk about uh, that I haven't had a chance to mention already. I mean, firstly, there's the boat. Uh, I already knew that this was a brilliant head sea boat because it, it proved that in some really difficult uh, conditions. Uh, but then we came across the Baltic and it handled the beam sea and the following sea with real aplomb. I mean, because of that steep forefoot and those uh, acute hull angles. You have to elevate the uh, bow a touch just to avoid steering by the bow so you can retain control and comfort. But uh, it's rare that a boat that's so adept with a head sea uh, is so comfortable when the sea hits you on different angles and big seas at like that. So that was impressive. And the second thing I want to just mention is the, the culture of boating in this part of the world. And it seems like a principle enshrined in law, as well as in the minds of the Finnish people, that the wilderness is theirs to enjoy. Uh, and that seems perhaps a touch strange to an Englishman visiting. But the fact of the matter is with 18, uh, 180,000 islands, I should say, um, although some of those are privately owned, those that aren't, you get facilities like toilets and barbecues and saunas, and it means that if you're boating, even on a modest boat, a, a relatively affordable boat with no heads compartment, you can tie up, you can step ashore, you can camp on your boat, you can camp ashore, you can have a sauna, you can enjoy the wilderness because it's yours to enjoy. And that is a wonderful thing. And not just for Finnish people, but for people who choose to come here and cruise. This is a very impressive and memorable place to come boating. You know, I, I, I came here four days ago and I've been looked after by a bunch of guys who've treated me like their mate from day one, which has been magnificent. Um, and the boat has been just as impressive. They both looked after me equally well. And the first opportunity I get to come back to this part of the world, I'm absolutely here.